I'm very happy to, to talk about in those response meta-analysis using weighted mixed effect models. And um, so thank, thank you to the organizers of this uh, webinar. And um, so what is the plan? Um, well, I will, um, we, we will get started with some examples, uh, data challenges of um, using mixed effect models for those response meta-analysis. We will see some basic characteristics of, um, of the model. And then I will introduce this idea of thinking in terms of uh, quantiles to, to draw some, some inference about the, the parameter that we are interested in. I will also mention statistical software, uh, visualizations of uh, quantiles derived from the model, and also some you know, practical applications um, in either real or simulated data. And then I will, um, I will close with some final remarks, and then we can have you know, questions and answers. And uh, before we get into you know, examples, data, and challenges, I would like to, to get started with a quick uh, pool. I know people is coming in, um, but I would ask Dario if you can um, run the poll. Um, so the question is, you know, who are you? You know, what is your occupation? Are you a student, a researcher, statistician, meta-analyst? Just to get a little bit of feedback to know who is, you know, participating in this uh, um, webinar. Okay. So many doctor students, researchers, statisticians. <clears throat> Okay, so about 30% students, 40% researchers, 20% of statisticians, and a few others. Okay, okay, that's good. Uh, thank you very much. And the, the other question that I, that, I, that I have is to what extent you are already familiar with those response meta-analysis. <clears throat> Okay, it seems that, you know, very much, somewhat, not at all. Okay, it seems that, uh, okay, it's kind of a uniformly distributed 20% a lot, and 40% somewhat, another 40% not at all. Okay, that's good, that's good. Um, that's great. So I hope that uh, this webinar has something to offer to to, to all of you, you know, independently of uh, how much familiar you are already with this topic. Um, okay, I think I can, I can close this. I can close this. Okay, thank you very much. So let's get started with some examples. Okay, so just to get a taste of what is those response meta analysis. And um, I'm gonna move this a little bit over here. Um, maybe I can close also this. So let's start with this, blood pressure effect of sodium concentration. Those response meta-analysis of experimental studies. This was published in Circulation 2021. And so this is a, um, this is a graph, what we can see here, summarizing the main findings of this, you know, combination of experimental uh, studies. And so here, the, the point here is that um, this is probably the first application of a one stage of a weighted mixed effect models um, that has the key advantage, if you use a one stage mixed effect models, is to, you know, is, is very, is including, yet you, you have the possibility to include all the studies available, regardless or independently of how many contrasts each study managed to, to conduct. And so basically in a classical dose response meta analysis, you need to have at least, you know, um, you know free comparisons. Otherwise you just, if you, have, if you only have one comparison, you just connect the, the, the two dots. So traditionally, uh, for conducting a dose response method analysis, you, you know, uh, you have to pick studies 
we have a certain amount of contrast. We have one stage instead, you can take advantage. This is no longer a requirement. Um, so you can have studies where you have more or less information and they all join in the analysis. So this was a nice application of um, weighted mix effect models. And here the key findings was that, you know, there was approximately linear relationship between sodium intake and, and systolic um, and blood pressure. And uh, so this was using uh, also restricted cubic splines as a way to, to identify possible non-linearities. Um, this one, this is another study about uh, publishing JAMA uh, Psychiatry 2021, examination of dosing of antipsychotic drugs for relapse prevention in patients with stable schizophrenia. So in um, this type of studies, um, the, the overall goal is to find like the, the most effective dose. You know, what, is the, um, what is the dose associated with most of the effect of the drug? And um, so there is a need of trying to, to get the shape right. Uh, and then from the shape, from the dose response curve, then deriving you know, what is the point such that you have 80, 90% of the effect. And um, so this is a typical summary of, um, of a dose response meta analysis. As you can see, you have on the Y axis, uh, like a measure of effect, uh, an odds ratio in this case, on the X axis, you have this uh, predictor, you know, typically a dose, um, and then this is the blue line here is the, is the dose response for the average study and we have confidence bands around. So you can shade the, you know, the 95% the confidence interval point by point um, of, the dose, of the predicted dose response relationship for the average study. So this is another example. This is, was published recently, Lancet Public Health, 2022, daily steps and all cause mortality, a meta-analysis of 15 international cohorts. So, <clears throat> so this, is, uh, this is interesting because um, uh, this is a pooling of individual uh, patient data. And um, so it's a kind of prospective meta-analysis because when the investigators, they get together, it's perspective rather than retrospective. And the interesting thing is that um, they were using weight and mixed effect models. So mixed effect models, one stage approach based on aggregated data derived from harmonization of the analysis. And I think also this is interesting um, line of uh, application because you know, pulling individual data sets it's very time consuming and expensive. So, so again, weighted mix effect models can facilitate, can speed up the old process. There's no need to share individual data, but you can share estimates obtained from a st you know, standardized analysis. So this is a nice example of it. And, and similar to the previous example, you have a measure of effect, you know, the, in this case, hazard ratios because they were pulling prospective studies. So those are hazard ratios of mortality according to the steps per day. Of course, this is an observational study. So is those hazard ratios are adjusted for you know, all the potential confounding variables. And here you can see there are two curves you know, for the two different age groups. And um, they were using also splines with a possible interaction between the, the steps per day and age. So we have seen some examples of individual researchers, a group of researchers um, interested in answering and uh, summarizing all the available evidence uh, arising from randomized experimental studies or observational studies. There are also international organizations like the World Cancer Research Foundation uh, that is running a continuous update project on, um, on all the, on, um, and, and trying to provide uh, updated evidence about you know, diet, physical activity, uh, anthropometric measure in relation to cancer risk or cancer survival. 
So they are using those response meta-analyses to, you know, to update the, um, what, it, what is known so far about a certain relationship. Uh, another international organization, and I have been involved in a, in, in a project recently, for example, the European Food and Safety Authority. Um, so they wanted to know, they wanted to use those response meta-analyses to identify, you know, um, for risk assessment. Um, so this is um, the results of the report if you are interested in this specific uh, application. And another international organization um, is the WHO, for example, had been asked to participate into um, a systematic review of the effect of exposure to radio frequency fields on cancer risk in the general working population. And so this is, a, um, this is supported by WHO. They want to provide you know, what is the best available evidence about this. And there is, um, so the outcome is neoplasm, neoplasm risk and the exposure is cumulative call time and total number of calls. And, um, and, and the topic of course is, is so crucial that you know, in, within the group, we, uh, we put together and we publish a protocol. Uh, so before you even start collecting data or doing any, any type of analysis, you try to, to have a plan. And um, so, and here you can see, this is the part I just uh, copy and paste, the, the part describing the dose response meta-analysis. So it's like kind of paragraph where you are, you're writing down how you're planning to analyze uh, all the available evidence. So here you can see this will use weighted mix effect models suitable for, suitable for table of correlated estimates. So there is the, this reference of my previous doctoral students on statistical methods for medical research, a paper here on um, publishing a data journal is the describing you know, the, pr the procedure to, to get the estimates in data. Um, then we have references for using splines or whatever transformations of the dose you're interested in. And also there's a part where you can, say, you can describe uh, what is the main target of the statistical inference. Because you know, mixed effect models are very rich, powerful. So you may want to, uh, so you can potentially, you can extract a lot of information from, from them. So you may want to say, you know, what is your primary target for statistical inference and typical typically as we have seen in the few examples there is the the major interest is in the uh, those response relationship for an average study under the assumption of um, of a random effect or under the assumption of heterogeneity of uh, those response relationships and um, so it's important, of course, when you use, like for any, for, like for any statistical model, it's good to have a plan uh, in advance. And also, uh, you also need to have the skills to, to conduct the plan. And um, also that is important. And software, of course, is usually helping, um, but it's, um, it's very crucial in those response meta analysis because the questions are advanced, a detail, relevant, you can, you can have a lot of impact, a highly influential, published in top journal. And so, and, and, but the data, of course, you know, you are working with tables of estimates oftentimes. So that's why you have to be, of course, um, you need to get familiar with the topic itself, you know, with the subject matter and the, the questions and uh, the statistical models and, uh, and all the information that you can get out, out of it. So what is common in these examples? Well, there is a quantitative factor measuring either experimental or observational study. So it could be a self-administered uh, exposure um, or a drug. So those response meta-analysis is relevant no matter how the treatment or exposure was allocated. The effect measure can be of any type, you know, mean differences, odds ratios, hazard ratios. The research questions are about the shape of the dose response relationship, typically for the average study, or some specific 
less known aspect of it. An example could be for uh, alcohol consumption and mortality. Many observation studies found that there is a J shape. And so of course, you know, if you drink a lot of alcohol, it's not a surprise that there is a high mortality risk, but oftentimes, and that is not, that is out of the question. So the debate, kind of the, not the confusion, but the debate about certain uh, effect is always about a certain comparisons of interest. For example, the never drinkers versus the moderate drinkers. And so you want to get the shape right. And also you want to focus on certain comparisons of interest. Now they, you can use weighted mix effect models uh, in a meta-analysis where you can, you can think your, your planet retrospectively. So let's, let's go back and see what kind of studies um, investigated and provided some answer to a certain question. Or you can think prospectively in an pooling project. So you can have a collection of investigators putting an effort to, to answer um, questions that none of them was able to do to answer in, in their own specific cohort studies. So either way, you can use this weighted mix effect models. And actually working with aggregated data is the, has the advantage of several advantages. It's very efficient from a, it's, it's much faster rather than sharing, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of data. Uh, and also, so another common thing is a statistical model. If you want to learn something from all these tables of empirical estimates arising from different studies, well, you need to not only to have a plan, but also you need to, to have a vision. You need to have a question, of course, and specify a, a model that is capable of answering that question using as less number of parameters as possible. And um, so this is what is in common in all these examples. And I want to give you an idea of the data. You know, I, I mentioned uh, weighted mix effect models for table correlated estimates. So the, the, the typical data that you need to collect for to run a dose response meta-analysis is something like this. This is kind of rate ratios of prostate cancer according to categories of BMI. So you can see here we have different, uh, this is BMI. BMI. Then you have the median, for example, BMI within each group, the number of cases, the person years, this is a prospective study and some measures of effect, you know, typically a rate ratio, eventually adjusted for confounding variable. And so this is the, what defines the data. And what, he, what we are modeling with uh, in those response meta analysis is a measure of effect, it's this column. We're modeling a measure of effect as a function of X, the quantitative factor, which is a, a typical value within each category. So it's kind of common to, if you have some data, it's common to, to make a scatter plot. And so whenever you use weighted mix effect models, whenever you're doing meta-analysis of empirical estimates, people is, in general tends to use all the techniques that you learn in the context of individual data. And uh, so you can do a scatter plot. For example, here you can see one is going up and then down. And then, you know, you can connect the dots just to, to say, well, in this specific study, then this is the nurse professional health study, but what is the kind of the shape of the relationship observing that specific study? And, and then, you know, people is trying to, okay, let's, uh, let's see what is the trend. You know, you're gonna use, for example, a linear function, and then you're gonna estimate, you know, what is the change, for example, in prostate cancer rate for every five unit increase of uh, body mass index. And, and this is, here you can see, this is a classical thing that you have a table of estimates comparing, you know, presenting hazard ratio relative to a, a common reference group. And then you use that to estimate the trend. And that's, and that is, 
classical comparison. Okay, you compare the observed or estimated outcome and the predicted outcome, and then you you want to use this as a way to judge, you know, how good is the model fit. So this is a classical thing, and hope, oftentimes it happens something like this. So you have the the empirical estimates from the table that are, you know, on one side here, and then you get the trend in the opposite side, and many people get confused. And so, my God, this model is not fitting the data. You know, a linear function is not an adequate summary of this table of estimates. And, uh, and this is, you know, this is happening for a single study. So you can imagine if you have multiple studies and you try to, to evaluate goodness of fit by simply comparing, you know, observed estimates and the fit of trend. So there are some challenges here. And this is another example. This is alcohol intake and colorectal cancer. Um, so you get a table of um, measures of effect as compared to never drinkers. You get the median alcohol intake with each category, and then we regress Y on X. And, and this is what, what is happening, you know, that, so, and I, I wrote like a, a few paragraphs, a couple of paragraphs in a book chapter in, a, in this book, Handbook of Meta-Analysis with Donna Spiegelman about, you know, the challenge of comparing, naive comparison of observed versus predicted exposure effect. And so you can see, as, if, as we have seen for the case of BMI, here you can see that, well, the predicted trend is above on top of all the, it's not going through the observed contrast. And so, and the reason I explained this in this book chapter, uh, the reason is that in a dose response meta-analysis, we shouldn't forget that what is the process leading to to those stable estimates. So those stable estimates are themselves the product of, of a model, of a choice of modeling a quantitative exposure. So typically, you know, the step function, you know, 90% of the, of the epidemiological studies dealing with a quantitative factor, they just categorize and then they present um, contrast as compared to a common reference. And so, um, well, the problem is that, of course, if you have two results, you analyze the same thing using two parameterization. If what happened is that if the predicted outcome at the chosen reference is, is very different under the two parameterization, then also the relative change is going to be very different. So one way to have the to see this agreement between you know, the table of estimates and the predicted trend is to use um, a reference as reference group for comparing the two parameterization where the predicted outcome is pretty much the same. So also the relative risk or the change is going to be pretty much the same. And, um, but of course, so we have a problem. No, no, it's a challenge, I would say. It's a challenge in, in those response meta analysis. Um, which of course, it can get even more problematic when you have multiple studies. For, for example, let's consider experimental data. You have some mean differences. You get the standard error, the mean differences, some basic descriptive statistics, standard deviation of the outcome, the sample size. So basically you can see that here, well, the reference group is, is the lowest value for all the studies. And, uh, but the reference group may change. The number of contrasts may change across studies. And so a common approach is to, to look at one by one and try to guess and pick up the shape of the relationship by simply connecting the dots. Okay, so that's very simple. I have a few points, you connect the dots and you guess the shape. But this is... Um, this approach is not great. You know, it doesn't help so much. Actually, oftentimes you, uh, you get lost in all this, you know, study-specific analysis. And um, in the sense that they don't help to see what is, the pro what, is the, what is the possible mechanism underlying a collection of studies. So in a sense, you try to get into 
a good fitting for each of the individual studies, ignoring the big picture or trying to guess, okay, those studies are different or you may start commenting about heterogeneity across studies. Mm. In general, it helps to put everything together. So one stage mean, approach means, okay, let's, let's put all this data set, data set or estimate, table of estimates together, and let's try to answer some questions in light of all of these uh, samples. And it's difficult. Reference group can change. You have studies going up, some, certain studies you know, show no effect, other in the opposite direction. And um, so it's definitely not an easy task to, to model this type of uh, data. And so what are the main features of the data? Why am I talking about this stuff? Because the response is typically an exposure effect, is a change in whatever uh, outcome measure you're modeling. The exposure effect within a study are typically positively correlated the number of exposure contrasts may vary across studies. Also, the doses, you know, the, the exposure level being compared also may change across studies. It doesn't need to be the same. And the number of regression coefficients needed to answer a certain question may be greater than the number of contrasts within, within a study. So if you have only uh, one comparison, well, the only thing that you can do is to connect with a line the two points. And so there's a challenge of balancing model complexity and aggregated data. It's very difficult because you need to keep it simple. And, and you need to see, you need to use the data that you have you know, to go beyond that. Uh, it's not, Meta-analysis is not just a description of the data being collected, but you want to learn something from it. And so, for example, this is a picture showing an adjust that has the ratios of functional walking, and then you're wondering, is there, what kind of relationship is underlying all of these studies, okay? The more you walk and the less you're likely to die, or the less, the lower is the mortality rate, fine. Is there any leveling off? Is there any, is any level of walking that um, such that you know beyond that? Is there any threshold effect of walking? It's difficult. It's difficult to answer this question. And so another thing, another challenge is this: you know, the classical statistical fallacy. This has nothing to do with mixed effect models or to, or meta analysis. It's just the. It's a common fallacy, but it's you know is the consequences of this fallacy in a meta-analysis, in a dose response, it can be, you know, it can be highly influential as compared to a fallacy of this type in a single study. So failing to reject the null, a p-value greater than 0.05 or a confidence interval including the null is frequently and mistakenly interpreted as evidence for the null. This is true for a single study, it's also true for a meta-analysis. So in both test of hypothesis and confidence interval, some selected extreme quantiles, you know, the 2.5 and 97.5, are routinely used to allocate some degree of trust about claims for the unknown parameter of interest. But the fact that in a dose response meta-analysis there might be several contrasts of interest, in a dose response meta-analysis, you get a curve. So there's a lot of contrast of interest, not just one. And so this is, of course, is, is making this challenge of, of the fallacy of acceptance uh, more likely to occur, simply because you have more questions that you would like to answer in light of the model. So, and let me, let me, um, let me ask you if you have any questions about it. And please actually, uh, I want to take a pause now. Um, I know that many of you that are, you are an expert or you have used, you're familiar with those response meta analysis. So please, can you write on the chat? Can you tell me what kind of quantitative factor you have in mind? What kind of outcome and what kind of uh, study design, experimental observation? You can, you can use the chat for doing that. You can write it 
on the chat. Just to have a, a sense of uh, what type of questions or data uh, you may have. Okay, in the meantime, I see I keep the chat over here. In the meantime, so let's see what are the main characteristics of the mixed effect model. So we have seen what is the major target of inference? The dose response for the average study with some degree of confidence attached to it. Um, the data specific are, are the data have some unique features. And so the model is reflecting all these characteristics. And so it's, it's a classical mixed effect model. And uh, so you can recognize, you know, the statisticians here, they can, they can recognize, you know, the fixed effect, the random effect. It's a classical, you know, regression model um, with some weights. That's the difference. And also there is no, there is no intercept uh, in, this, uh, in this model. So the outcome, what is the dependent variable is, is a vector of empirical contrast, you know, mean, estimated mean differences, estimated log odds ratios or log hazard ratios. As, you know, so we got this contrast relative to our comma referent. And in a mixed effect models, if you use in this formulation here, if you use a couple of regression coefficients to, to model the effect of the exposure, well, you will have a couple of random effect, one for each of the regression coefficients. So this is the, it is implemented in Stata, in R. So basically you get the maximum likely estimate or restrict the maximum likely estimates of all the parameters, you know, either fixed effect or the variance, variance covariance components of it. And um, so the, the key thing is that, uh, of course, this is taken care of by, by those procedures the, by those commands, but because we are modeling contrast in outcome measures, we also have to kind of center um, the value of the dose. Otherwise, everything is screwed up. So this is occurring internally um, in the in the procedure in the software. So random effect. The random effect represents study specific deviations from the average study regression coefficient. We put random effect on all of the regression coefficients. And the residual error term here, of course, is assumed to, to follow a multivariate normal with an average of zero and the certain weights, uh, variance covariance structure. So we got a table of estimates. So we have the diagonal elements, the variances, but also we have to you know, take into account the covariance between all these study specific contrasts. So, um, and there are different ways you can, that's why it's called weighted mixed effect models. Uh, and S here can be approximated because oftentimes the covariance is not published. You know, typically you have the coin estimate and confidence interval. So you derive the variance from the confidence interval, um, but you don't have the covariance. So there are different ways of reconstructing or approximating this covariance. Um, but now let's get to the point of, we have seen some examples of those response. We have seen the features of data. We have a, a mixed effect models that is able to take into account um, heterogeneity across studies. So there is a distribution of uh, possible genuine uh, dose response relationship. And so, and we want to draw some inference about the, the effect measure that um, that we are uh, looking for. So we have to distinguish, you know, in a random effect meta analysis. One thing is the distribution of um, of, uh, of estimates in a population of studies, uh, which is something different as compared to the inference, the uncertainty related to um, uh, an effect uh, for the average study. So this is a classical kind of application of the central limit theorem. I can see here in the chat, there are some messages here. Prospective cohort studies, food groups and cancer incidents, uh, Neda, Antonio, 
for example, I was reading a paper on dose response methanized for silica exposure in lung cancer. Okay, that's it. The rest of the crowd is just listening to me. Okay, Sylvia. I'm not an expert, but it's very difficult for me to understand how it works. I can suggest a book of basic lines for beginners. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. Well, yes. I mean, there are papers. There are kind of research articles. I wrote a book chapter for, um, for this book, Handbook of Meta-Analysis, uh, which is a nice book uh, covering all the topics, all modern topics in uh, meta-analysis, including those response. And I also, probably it will come up soon, um, the book, the third edition of Systematic Reviews, edited by Matthias Egger, George Davis Smith, is a classical book which is coming out as a third edition. There is a book chapter aim at um, not statistician, but um, someone who wants to get started uh, with this. But um, definitely, you know, it's, uh, I have been working on those response analysis, same here, wrong. I have been working on those response meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials using a Bison network meta-analysis approach, working with physical activity as a dose at the moment. Yes, um, yeah, there has been also recent attempt to, to combine uh, those response meta-analysis with network meta-analysis, with or without you know, Bison approach. Uh, Georgian, yes, very good. So, mm, in Georgia, I can see Georgia here on the chat. So this is a, um, Georgia has been working a lot on trying to put together you know, network meta-analysis and those response. So this is a current, is an active area of research. So, but, you know, going back, going back to, thank you for, for using the chat. Now, uh, let's get to the, to the quantile approach. Okay. Let's see. Let's get to the quantile approach. So let's imagine, because you know, in, in, this is a classical figure distinguishing the variation in the, in the treatment effect across in a population of studies relative to the uncertainty when you conduct inference on the average uh, treatment effect. <clears throat> and in a dose response meta analysis, basically you have this couple of curves, you know, the blue line and the yellow line and the yellow curve point-wise, you know, comparison by comparison, you know, 10 versus zero, nine versus zero, and so on. So, so you need to, in a dose response meta-analysis using mixed effect models, you need to keep up a little bit with this, you know, line of reasoning. And, um, and so we need to have, so we have a, a regression coefficient. It could be the slope of a line, but then you have a certain contrast of interest, you know, x relative to x zero. And the interesting thing is that this comparison, it doesn't need to be observed in any of the single study. You know, we know that the input of a dose response method analysis are all these different contrasts, maybe, you know, at different levels of the exposure. Well, you want to learn something from it to then derive and estimate a contrast that you care about. You, you know, you're not bounded by the chosen reference of any of all the individual studies. And so there is a regression coefficient beta, for example, the slope of an line, and then there is a certain distance between the exposure levels that you're comparing. And so to, to make it, uh, and so you can see that here, this is the, the slope this is a distribution of, uh, of slopes across studies centered about the average with a certain spread. And this is a very simple case where you can see, well, the spread of, of this uh, contrast depends on the between study variability and the VPN. And uh, I think I have a figure for that. And so going, getting to the quantiles of the margin condition those response, what is it? Well, I distinguish Basically, the quantiles of the condition of those response, it means that you're thinking about you know, a population uh, of studies. And this is like a prediction interval, quantiles of a prediction interval, not just you know, 2.5 and 
like there is something special with those two extreme quantiles, but rather try to, to think in a continuous fashion and, and use all the quantiles from one to 99 for both um, inference on, the, on what's going on in, in a population of studies, or when you are, want to draw your inference about the, um, the effect for the average study. So we are distinguishing conditioning and uh, marginal quantiles. And, um, and so here, for example, uh, a graph of it, let me see. So this is an example. So you have the um, yellow, you have all the quantiles, one to 99 for the marginal. And then you have this blue line, you know, shaded um, percentiles for the, con for the conditional uh, quantiles. And um, so I would say the yellow line is the, is the classical one that you see in any application is the confidence into for the for the treatment effect for the average study the blue line is instead reflecting the overall uncertainty if you have to perform a new study that's what you can expect and um, kind of variation that you can expect and so what is the point why i'm talking about quantile approach for those response method analysis well because you can have two situations where these the inference on the average study is pretty much the same, but you know, in a situation where you have more heterogeneity across studies, well, it, you know, it gives you another perspective. So you can be precise on the on conducting inference for the average study, but then, as you can see here, well, if you attach to that uh, the conditional quantiles, you can see that there is a 40, 60 percent of the studies uh, in the opposite direction. And relative to the average study. So this is something to keep in mind. And so if you're, about, if you're thinking about, okay, let's conduct a study comparing those two specific levels. Well, the average study can be successful, but this, the variation is such that uh, uh, there's a high chance that uh, a lot of studies can be predicted to observe you know, an effect in the opposite direction. And so those, so this is a simple case, you know, just a straight line fitting the data, but you can, ex you, you know, those you know, mixed effect models, you can go beyond straight lines. Of course, you can use step function, you know, you can use splines of different degree uh, using different um, cutoff. And you can see here, there's a variation of, um, of modeling choice. You know, it depends on the question you're trying to answer. Those are described in this uh, book chapter. So it doesn't need to be linear, non-linear. You know? The most fancy things, splines versus the easiest thing on earth, a line. You know, you can have, uh, the question may be such that you, you, you may want to use a combination of, um, of, um, of splines. So we need to extend, you know, quantize reasoning uh, when you go beyond just one regression coefficients, but that's, um, uh, that's just an extension. You just, of course, I know many of you may be lost here, but this is quant you know, the margin and condition quantize re when you have more, for example, two regression coefficients. So you have a variance covariance matrix for the fixed effect. You have variance covariance uh, matrix for the estimated random effect and so on. So for example, you can see here an application where you have um, here very little heterogeneity across studies. So the, the yellow line is the average dose response. And here you can see a high heterogeneity across studies. Okay, so, the, um, so this is a way of visualizing uh, the, um, the, the overall uncertainty. Uncertainty for the average dose response versus the uncertainty across uh, studies. And so Ideally, it would be great to have past estimation command that works for a variety of those transformation outcome measure, allow the user to choose between quantile of the conditional module of both, allow the user to overlay study specific, you know, the best linear and biased predictions, easy, easily provides static interactive visualization. I am a Stata user, so I develop, you know, I, take a, I took advantage of the integration between Stata in Python, and I and I wrote some um, interactive visualization like this. Let's see, I, I have a picture here. Um, so, for example, this. 
So basically, it's a post estimation command. So you can get a kind of a web page with all these um, uh, conditional quantiles. Those red are kind of the empirical bias estimates for this only for the few studies that you have in the studies. Um, so you and then you can you know you can look at it and say, well, look at this level for this comparison A versus five. There is you know what is this? A, let me see if I can get, there is maybe 40, can, I can't read, uh, it's probably too much, but you can look at the, what is the fraction study that can be expected below a certain level um, to get an idea of the heterogeneity of those studies. And now, because now we are running out of time, and um, so let me go back to the slides. Um, so I developed this past estimation procedure and for example, you know, if you remember, we open up with this example, you know, what is the dose response relationship here? Is there any threshold effect uh, below two hours of um, walking per week? You know, it's very hard to tell by keep looking at these pictures. So you can specify a mixed effect dose response model with a piecewise linear spline at two hours per week. And then, okay, you get, this is how you get the estimates, the trend before and after the uh, two hours per week, the estimates of the variance, covariance component, and then you can, you know, you can get, you can get a visualization uh, of this type. So look, you know, so you, you start off with this, you know, bunch of points that are very difficult to interpret, and you finish up with um, inference quantiles for the average study, which is kind of precise. You can see that, you know, there is a threshold effect here beyond two hours per week. And so if there is a threshold effect, well, it means that 50% of the studies are gonna show a harmful effect and the other half is going to show um, a harmful effect. So, so this comparison of blue uh, and yellow colors can give us an idea of the, of the extent of a heterogeneity, to what extent it matters. And uh, if you have to, if you have to do another study on, on that specific question. Okay, and, and I have a few other examples. I'm gonna share my slides for both you know, linear and non-linear relationship. This is another case, alcohol and colorectal cancer risk, where there is not that much heterogeneity across studies. Also, this is good to know. There might be cases where the heterogeneity is huge. There is still a lot of things to know about these sources of uh, heterogeneity. Other situations where, you know, th there is a tiny discrepancy between um, condition and marginal quantiles like this. And this you can use for both um, individual patient data meta-analysis or aggregated data meta-analysis. So as a final remark, so the key assumption for deriving quantiles of, in a mixed effect models, of course, is the normal distribution for the random effect. So all, the th all my derivation of quantiles are by just taking the inverse of a, of a cumulative distribution function of a normal. The key advantage of a quantile approach for inference is to learn in a continuous fashion. If you want to reduce the fallacy of acceptance, then I think that we should get away 95% you know, confidence into it. Or at least you can think one-sided. Uh, you can only consider one uh, quantile of confidence. Without, you know, if you provide two numbers, people will only check if the null is included, yes or no. So in, in a sense, a quantile approach, one to 99, is helping me at least to, to think in a continuous fashion rather than binary, accept, don't accept, included or not included. And also interactive visualization in, in those response, you need to get something out of the model. It's not that you write sentences about the regression coefficient that they're that you get to see. You need to data, you have to work with more than one regression coefficient. So a visualization is the way to go. And, and so also to learn about heterogeneity, I think that uh, a, a visualization it, it would be helpful. So here are some selected references, uh, what I have done. Um, and also if you're interested in them, um, you, there are five references about uh, the severity principle or a quantile approach, the quantile of confidence, confidence distribution. 
And so here you can see um, some references. Actually, those are books, um, probably not, not, not widely known, but I think that it would be beneficial to, to think about those things in the context of meta-analysis in general, and in particular, those response when the question that you're trying to answer uh, are more advanced. Okay, I think I can stop here and then we can, we can, we can talk a little bit if you have questions. Okay. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicola. Um, and also thanks to Georgia for um, putting a reference uh, into the chat that people who are um, wanting more of an introduction to this area might be able to look at. Uh, Georgia, you have a question and I've unmuted you. So you should be able to ask that now. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Nicola, for a nice uh, presentation. And I'm, I'm uh, very happy to see that uh, this uh, uh, issue of uh, what, what I would call prediction intervals yes. Uh, yes. has been cracked from the frequentist point of view. We've been driving them primarily within a, a Bayesian framework, which it's much more easy to crack compared to what uh, uh, you have been doing. Um, I would like actually to ask you something that a little bit uh, uh, bothers me and I found difficult to swallow um, in the interpretation of those prediction intervals. Can you put maybe on the screen one of the graphs you saw that have the, the yellow and the blue lines, uh, maybe one with more uh, heterogeneity? That was... Uh... I hear, example, this. Yeah, fine. Uh, although I cannot really see that. Oh, yeah, fine. Okay, so um, the wh what I find a little bit uh, difficult in the interpretation uh, of those prediction intervals, we, we are used to interpret them as what you are expecting to see in a new study, correct? Yes. So let's say we want, we, we plan to to make a new study between two hours per week versus three hours per week. Yeah. And, and we expected to find, to, to find the results yeah. in, in this, exactly in this um, area. Yeah. If we plan to do a study, exactly the same study, the same design, the same people, but for four hours per week, yeah. We anticipate we, we will have a much larger area where the true effect will be there. And somehow I find a little bit difficult to understand why a study, or intuitively, let's say, mathematically, of course, we understand that because in the the the, the various is a function of the horizontal axis here. So you multiply by by the square root of your dose practically, and that's why you get larger. Uh, with towards the ends of the spectrum, but you know, intuitively, I fail to understand why just by changing the exposure, keeping everything else in the study exactly the same, you expect more heterogeneity or more variability in, in in what you 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 will see when the study finishes. Do you have something to help the interpretation of that? Well, you know, you're right, because, you know, the exposure effect, you know, is the exposure effect, it depends on the distance between the two values of those being compared. So in a sense, this is a mathematical thing. And so the more, the more you, you move far away from the reference, then the, there will be a greater estimated treatment effect and also larger, because also the standard error is multiplied by the distance uh -huh. with the two points being compared. So there is this, um, so basically the fact that uh, the confidence interval, you see, are getting closer at two, they are getting closer at two. So this is something that is happening by definition, but that's math. So it's nothing to do with how much data we have for that specific uh, value of the dose. So that's, um, uh, so that's, uh, of course, and that's why you see here, you know, the, the turning point, uh, let me see, the turning point in you know, the, the, the threshold effect is happening, uh, I'll show you the data. The threshold effect is happening here at two hours per week. You know, those are data 
uh, that I simulated. So I know the threshold is happening here at two and there is no data whatsoever at two. So uh, this is, you know, of course it's interesting, but it's helping to reflect that the uncertainty about the treatment effect depends on the distance from whatever reference group we pick. And, uh, and so even if, even if you see, you have, we are very precise around two hours per week, but there is no studies whatsoever around that point. So I, I, see, so I see the challenge, George, I see the challenge of, of this way of defining uncertainty because we are reasoning in terms, at least what I have done so far, I've been reasoning in terms of treatment effect. So it's a measure, it's a distance. So one way to address your question, uh, it would be to think in the absolute terms. What is the absolute mortality rate? So I would need a constant. And so I would need to do a dose response meta-analysis where I know the baseline rate, not only the rate ratio. So that would be the ideal but, and um, situation where I think that don't, if you have the baseline rate, then we could, you know, we could do a better job um, because the confidence interval would reflect how much people you have, how, many, how much information you have for certain comparison. And you don't have this kind of artificial you know, increasing of the conf of uncertainty only due to math, <laughs> if, you, if you like. And um, so definitely a better, if you have the absolute occurrence of the outcome, go for it. But the problem, and especially if you have randomized trials, maybe you have it. In, the problem is in observational studies, looking for explanations, you know, adjusting for whatever, then typically, of course, when you, you, you only have adjusted treatment effect. So that's the only thing that you have. Okay, I hope, I hope Georgia, um, I answer your question, but uh, definitely there is more to do. Definitely there is more to do um, here. Okay. Thank you for that. Now we nearly, well, we are at the hour now. So um, obviously if you have to disappear um, to other commitments, then please yeah. do so. Um, I would like, uh, can I say one more thing? You know, this is a dose response meta-analysis, the weighted mixed effect models is an area of active research. And so I, I sh share some ideas. I mean, there is some papers still to write about this topic and uh, and pl so please, I mean, I encourage anybody who, with some ideas or specific data to, to contact me if you, if you like. And um, we also try to invest a little bit of the, on this topic in the Cochrane Sweden. I, you know, I'm part of the advisory board of Cochrane Sweden and we have a plan to, you know, to invest a little bit more on those response methodologies, at least in terms of education, as some of you, you know, kind of ask, you know, how did you get start how get get you started with this topic okay so thank you very much for being here and i uh, hope to see you some other time